Seeking Daylight Part 1, Journey to the Underhill Gates. Narrated by Million Quinteros. Chapter 8, An Odd Fellow. Andy had little idea where they were off to in such a hurry. Thomas had been leading the way as if on a mission. They spent little time talking and nearly the entire day walking. They had passed through the deep city corridors lined with tall stone and brick buildings. Then further still, passed all sorts of folks who were sipping their coffees in the cafes and catching up on things, just as Grandpa Andy had hoped to do himself during his trip to visit with his son. They had no time for that now. There were more important matters to attend to. His cup of coffee would have to wait for now. Gradually, the sun began to disappear behind the tall city buildings off in the distance and the stone office buildings gave way to townhouses. The concrete at their feet had turned to the pebbled roads that crisscrossed through the outskirts of town until they finally approached a small, cottage-style home. The postage stamp-sized parcel where the house sat was covered in a thin layer of snow, but Andy was easily able to discern that whoever had lived here was a gardener far superior to even him. Every square inch of the property had been filled with tilled rows and large wooden pots where plants of every imaginable kind had grown until that year's first frost. Andy recognized where elderflowers, dragon's breaths, artichokes, radishes, and garlic had been planted. There were bean plants, too. More beans than he imagined any family of people could possibly eat in their lifetime. At the west end of the home, rows of sunflowers stood hunched and wilted from the frost. There were hazelnut, pear, crabapple, and plum trees bordering the small flat stone path, too, each ushering them to the home's perfectly square front door, painted in a shade of bright blue. The home appeared to have been constructed from flat, stacked river stones, though it was difficult to see much behind the thick vines that crawled their way up the walls. Just beside the door was a small brass bell that hung from a hook. Thomas grabbed for the chain that dangled from within it and gave it a stern shake, creating a piercingly high-pitched ding, 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 ding. Who's that, Al? Why must you bother me? Came a muffled shout through the thick shut door. Thomas shot his father a glance as he shouted back, It's Tom Witherspoon. Open the door, Morgo. The two of them stood there in silence for long enough that Andy thought the man yelling from behind the door must have gone off to attend whatever he might have been doing before he and his son had clearly bothered him. But just as Tom raised his fist to thump it against the door, there was the sound of clicks and clacks coming from the other side as the man worked through the arduous process of unlocking what must have been a half a dozen deadbolts. The door eventually creaked open. Just enough of a crack that Andy could see the shadow of the man moving behind it. Raiden, is that you? The voice asked cautiously. I go by Tom up here, Morgo, you know that. Now, will you be opening the door, or shall I set up camp for the night on your doorstep? The door swung wide as the man took a step backward and stood with his arms stretched to his sides in a welcoming pose. He was an odd little man, not quite like anyone Andy had known. He was short, not so short that he might be considered a little person, but smaller than what Andy had considered to be of normal stature. He was of a slight build too, fragile and wiry. An older fellow, perhaps a bit younger than himself, yet his large and bright green eyes looked like they could have belonged to a young boy. He wore a brownish corduroy overcoat that covered a crisp white shirt and the straps of his light brown overalls. The only color in the man's outfit belonged to his pair of bright orange and well-worn shoes. Come in, my boy. You're letting all of the light out. It was an odd thing to say, Andy thought, as Morgo hastily waved for the two men to come in from the cold. Once Andy had stepped through the small man's doorway, handed his jacket to Morgo, and turned the corner into the home's main chamber, what he had meant by this odd statement quite literally came to light. It appeared as if it was high noon on the sunniest of summer days, Yet, as Andy gazed out of the waywardly facing wall of windows, only the smallest amount of light on the snow-covered horizon showed that the sun had ever existed at all. What was even more astonishing was that the room held not a single light bulb or lantern. Instead, there was an amazingly organized array of what appeared to be magnifying glasses and mirrors. A giant brass cone-shaped object that looked like a telescope was fixed looking through the windows, focused on where the sun had set behind the hills in the distance. 
It appeared to be taking the little remaining light and condensing it to the smaller end of the device, where it was then being shown onto an array of mirrors, fashioned in a shape much like the petals of a blooming flower. The way in which these mirrors were positioned sent the light to wash over the rest of the room. Quite clever indeed. The room was filled to the rafters with an organized chaos of plants of all kinds in various stages of bloom. Just at first glance, Andy spotted tomatoes, blueberries, watermelon, asparagus, and mulberries. Amazing, Andy said out loud. Just then the room grew quite dark, and quite all of a sudden. Andy looked around to see what had happened, and to be sure he hadn't somehow broken anything himself. The slight man frantically stepped to the device and took to spinning a small metal hand crank at its side. The crank was attached to a set of gears. Those gears then attached to the giant telescope-type object. Its larger end moved slowly along a track of glass ceiling panels and toward the opposite end of the room from where it had previously been pointing. The mirrors, attached to some type of arm mechanism, followed along with the smaller end of this light condenser and stayed perfectly positioned beneath it as it moved. Let us not waste the moonlight, the little man said as he frantically spun the hand crank just as fast as he could. Finally, the aim was just right and focused on the night's crescent moon, sending a bright glow awash over them once again. There now, Morgo said, quite satisfied with himself. Shall we have some tea then? Or perhaps some peach wine? Yes, yes, the peach wine should be very good by now. His short legs shuffled him away as he quickly disappeared from the room and down a darkened hallway. Who is this guy? Andy asked Tom, who had made himself at home in one of the man's chairs. He was careful to keep his voice down as he spoke, and only did so once he was certain Morgo was out of earshot. Thomas waved his hand dismissively. Eh, Morgo. He was sent up here to keep an eye on me when I left the underground. I've always been sure to keep two eyes on him. Well, should I be worried? This is all a little strange. Thomas chuckled at the thought of being worried about Morgo, of all things. He's harmless. It might have been due to our strange circumstance, but we've become an odd sort of friends over the years. We have an understanding, is probably a better way to put it. He leaves me alone, for the most part, and I won't send him back into the darkness. Andy felt himself relax a bit. He seems to be nice enough of a fellow, I suppose. Tom kicked his feet up and onto a nearby stool, looking quite relaxed himself. Of course, old Morgo's mood will likely change when I tell him what I have in store. Before Andy had the chance to ask, Morgo appeared from the hallway with a bottle of peach wine and three glasses in one hand a platter of carefully arranged fruits and vegetables in the other. Each sliced just so and displayed neatly on the large white plate. So what brings you out of your way and into mine this time, my boy? I suspect you are not here to simply share a glass of wine with me, although this vintage is quite good if I do say so for myself. Morgo set the glasses and platter onto a nearby table made from the cross section of a large log and poured each of them a generous amount. He handed Andy a glass, and Thomas took his own from the table. Morgo raised his into the air and made a toast. May the sun always shine warmly on our faces. The three men clanked their glasses together and took a swig of the sweet liquid. Tom's mood changed as he set his glass back onto the table beside him. Andy could tell that his son was trying to figure out when would be the best time to break whatever news he had carried with him to Morgo. Apparently now was as good as any. I'm afraid that I have come with a rather unpleasant request. I wouldn't have even come to ask it of you if it wasn't of such importance. It's my son. Morgo cut in before Tom could finish his thought. My boy, I've known this day was coming, and known what I must do far better than even you could ever explain to me. Thomas was obviously confused. But how are you certain that we are speaking of the same task? I should explain, again, Morgo interjected with what sounded like a passage he had memorized from a story he had once heard, or a book from which he had once read it. A seeker, the son of a seer, shall carry with him the very daylight that has shone upon the telling tree, and spread it unto all of the underground. You see, my boy, this is not a decision that you nor I have any business claiming as our own. We all have our places in the here and now. So those who come after us will have theirs in the days to come. I have little more choice in whether I am carrying out my task in this story of ours as you had ringing my bell or darkening my doorway tonight. I should have to explain this to you far less than I would to anyone else, Raynan. So you will go back? 
You will- Enough for tonight of what I will or will not do. You should know all the better than me that such things are of no use to spend even a moment quibbling over. It is out of our hands and into those of fate. Tonight, though. Tonight, we will eat, drink, and sun ourselves until we've had our fill. Tomorrow, we will see to the business at hand. Here, here, Andy spoke up, although very much unsure of what he was toasting to. Perhaps the wine had already gone to his head. This had all been very confusing to him, but it seemed that Tom was satisfied in what Morgo had agreed he must do, and somehow a toast seemed to be in order at that very moment to punctuate the situation at hand. Tom stood and looked appreciatively at Morgo as he retrieved and raised his glass beside Andy's. Morgo did the same, taking this opportunity to make his wishes known to the others. To the seeker, may the journey of he and his companions end only when they have again enjoyed the warmth of the daylight. Can't wait to find out what happens next? No problem. You can grab the first two complete books now for free by visiting pjowen.com forward slash free. 